Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're at. Thank you for coming and uh, sharing some time with us as we talk to you about a lot of the upcoming technologies and the way the consortium are working together to bring new technologies into our industry. Um, one of the things I need to tell you at the beginning is we're going to be recording this so that it can be available as for people who couldn't be here or attending other sessions at this time. And also, uh, people may have heard that there's a, a letter of intent between CXL and Gen Z about bringing those two organizations together. This panel doesn't have any more information than what was available in the online stuff that's on CXL and Gen Z websites. So we, we can't answer a whole lot of questions there. Um, so if you've got those questions, we encourage you to talk to the president of Gen Z or the chairman of CXL. With that, let me introduce myself. My name is Curtis Bowman. I work for AMD. I'm a member of both CXL and Gen Z. And today, we have a very exciting panel of local and remote people on our, our broadcast here. And with that, let me have them start with the introductions. And I will share the screen. Ahmad, we're going to start with you. And just do an audio check. All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. My name is Ahmad Dinesh. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Microchip Technology, and I'm representing the CXL Consortium for today's discussion. I'll give a brief introduction to CXL before we move to the roundtable and questions, but please do visit us at our virtual SC21 booth, uh, or if you are in person at SC21, you can find us at the CXL Consortium at booth 1607. And of course, you can always find more information at computexpresslink.org. Next slide. Yeah, I'm not able to advance the slides, so I'm looking for, it's here. All right, aha, 3% rule, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. So CXL is what it is today because of the wide adoption we have across the ecosystem and significant contributions being made from leading CPU, cloud, OEM, memory, silicon platform, and software providers. Uh, and the adoption and investments from over 165 member companies is making CXL a reality. And there's a number of live demos that we have available today. <coughs> Big thank you to all the contributing members for, for making it. <coughs> Next slide. CXL is focused on delivering the right features to address faster data processing, heterogeneous computing, memory capacity and bandwidth expansion, and fundamentally enabling the tuning of compute accelerator and memory resources for targeted application workloads. CXL is an open industry standard that provides high performance cache clear interconnect, and it does this by providing a coherent interface that leverages the PCIe physical layer, layer. That makes it really easy to adopt. It provides a low latency protocol for load store and memory and cache access. And it reduces a lot of complexity by enabling in asymmetric innovation of CPU and endpoints. We'll walk through some of the usage cases and some of the feature sets as well here. CXL has three mix and match sub protocols. We have a CXL.io, .cache, and .memory, or many of whom call just .mem for short, and that enables three different device types. CXL.io, as you'll see in this diagram, it's used for management, which is why it's needed for all the device types. .cache and .mem are high bandwidth, low latency protocols that enable faster data transfer, so you can spend less time moving the data and more time on actual data processing. The dot cache, its purpose is to provide devices like accelerators or NICs access to the processor's memory, whereas CXL.mem provides processors access to the device memory. So in addition to providing faster data transfer, CXL enables the host to expand more memory capacity and bandwidth Variety of media Let me interrupt you just a second, Ahmad. Could we ask people that are online to please mute their lines unless they're actively talking? We're getting a lot of feedback from somebody. Thank you, Ahmad. Thanks, Curtis. 
And being able to connect to this variety of media types, that provides us some media independence that then helps us to actually grow the different types of memory that we want to connect to, whether that's DRAM or new emerging technologies. Next slide. So a bit on CXL 2.0, which we introduced last, uh, last November. Uh, we introduced switching to enable larger scale memory expansion and memory pooling. With memory pooling, what you can do is you can allocate memory resources dynamically to hosts. That allows us to optimize how the mem deployed memory is utilized, providing a lot of efficiency. It reduces stranded memory. and allows us to meet the varying needs of different application workloads dynamically in real time. CXL also introduced support for persistent memory devices. This was really important so that we can now have a standard management of all memory types across all CXL supported processors. And we also introduced enhanced security with link IDE to prevent snooping and replay attacks on the CXL bus. CXL always is continuing to evolve. It is also backwards compatible with previous generations to ensure interoperability with previous devices, as well as maximizing your investments from previous generations. Right, thank you for your time. There is one question in the chat. Okay, we'll take your questions at the end. All right. Um, Let's go ahead and then move to Eric and Jim. We'll have you guys introduce yourselves here in the room. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, my name is Eric Hankey. I am Principal Engineer of Storage and Memory Products at Intelloprop. I have Jim Hull here with me. Uh, Jim is a uh, Senior Principal Software Engineer at Intelloprop. Uh, we are members of the CXL Consortium. We're also members of Gen Z Consortium. Today we're going to be uh, representing the Gen Z Consortium. So, go ahead. So uh, here I'm going to provide a, a quick introduction of Gen Z Consortium. Uh, the Gen Z Consortium is a collection of over 60 companies uh, who have come together to create a suite of specifications around memory-centric fabrics. Um, the consortium was formed in 2016, uh, and we're celebrating our five-year anniversary at this uh, supercompute event. If you're interested in learning more about the specifications or interested in contributing, uh, be sure to check out the website, genzconsortium.org, and follow us on Twitter and, and LinkedIn. Next slide, I'll jump into a little bit of the background of the technology and give a brief introduction. So for those who may not be uh, as familiar with Gen Z specification, uh, I'm going to jump into some of the, the key attributes. Uh, Gen Z is a open standard which defines low latency, high bandwidth, and scalable fabric solution, uh, which has built-in reliability availability and serviceability features such as multipathing and congestion management. Uh, it's been designed to support various PHY types, including PCIe PHY and longer reach 802.3 PHY, and has current support for low latency 50 gig um, 802.3 PHY. Uh, on the demo floor uh, downstairs, we're demonstrating fabric attached memory through multiple layers of Gen Z switches uh, using a mixture of copper and optical cables, so be sure to check us out down there. Uh, the fabric is designed to be secure and flexible, allowing for hardware-enforced isolation between components, uh, but sharing resources uh, is enabled by Fabric Manager, and we're showcasing some Fabric Manager software downstairs as well. Uh, it allows equal access to Gen Z attached memory uh, from any compute element, uh, such as CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, or other accelerator types. Uh, since Gen Z is a true fabric, requests can flow through the fabric uh, in any direction, uh, which enables built-in peer-to-peer communication and acceleration functionality uh, that can take place in various fabric-attached components. Um, another thing, and what we're talking about today, is Gen Z uh, enables growing the fabric uh, and, and supports disaggregation uh, from the ground up. Um, so we're pretty excited to talk about uh, these sort of capabilities and get some, some questions from uh, the attendees both here physically and, and virtually. Um, the next slide, I can talk about some of our collaboration um, in our industry relationships. Uh, we have a well-established relationship with our friends at SNEA, um, and uh, SNEA now uh, is the hub for form factor and connector specifications. Um, last year, we completed an agreement with CXL, uh, an MOU agreement, 
uh, with the goal of um, talking about bridging capabilities between the two specifications. And we have a, a demo of that uh, running uh, downstairs as well. Um, similarly, we're working with OFA to define a fabric management framework um, that can be used for Gen Z or other fabrics. Um, we're working on, on demos of, of that as well. So lots of really cool and exciting stuff going on, um, both here and, and on the virtual booths. So be sure to check us out. Well, thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. Now let's move to Rochelle to talk a little bit about SNEA. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Curtis. Uh, so I'm Rochelle Alvers. I uh, work for Intel. I'm a storage technology enablement architect there. Um, but uh, I spend a lot of time working in standards organizations, one of which is SNEA and OFA that he just mentioned as well. Uh, I'm uh, on the... Uh, I'm the vice chair of the board of directors for SNEA. I run the storage management initiative, and uh, I'm also the primary author for the Swordfish uh, uh, management standard for storage. Um, so a little bit about SNEA. We've been around for almost 25 years now. Um, we have we focus pretty much on anything storage, uh, you know, data management, uh, storage aspects, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We have 180. Uh, member companies with uh, over 2,500 people uh, as active contributors. Next. Okay. Um, as I said, we cover all things storage. So this lovely little tree uh, kind of talks about some of the the uh, areas that we're that we're working in. Back one. Back one. Thank you. Um, I hand this to you. No, you can take. It Thank you. It. <laughs> uh, so. Um, Eric already mentioned a couple of areas that we work with. Uh, some of the uh, have have specific alliances on just up in that upper right around physical storage. Uh, we have the SFF organization that's developed um, a whole lot of connector and form factor specs, uh, including EDSFF. So, um, moving into other areas, we have we have a focus on persistent memory. We have. Um, uh, marketing and promotional activities as well as technical activities uh, developing and supporting persistent memory as well as computational storage. Um, we have a tremendous focus as well on uh, network storage. Our network storage forum puts out a tremendous amount of educational material about uh, with vendor neutral content providing information about using all different kinds of network storage technologies. Um, back over on the other side you get to the, the storage management, the purple one down there with the little swordfish, that's me. Uh, uh, and uh, we do, we have uh, had um, close to 20 years worth of standardized management interfaces, the latest of which is swordfish. Um, and swordfish, uh, we partner with another group, uh, DMTF, that oh. develops Redfish for server management. Both of these were designed from the ground up to be scalable, uh, support disaggregation, um, you know, basically support next generation uh, manageability. And, uh, you know, last but not least, we have work going on in both green, um, you know, power efficiency management, metrics, uh, instrumentation, as well as a lot of work around uh, security of our standards, um, our, our interfaces, as well as, uh, you know, data protection and privacy. Um, I mentioned briefly scalability and disaggregation, so I just kind of highlighted a few of the areas here. It's very pervasive throughout the organization. Um, I will clearly talk a lot more about Swordfish than other things, because um, that's my baby. But uh, all of these areas in the boxes have, have work that they're doing in this area, which I wanted to highlight that since it was kind of one of the themes for today, just to get people moving a little bit into that direction. So, All right. Thank you very much, Rochelle. And now let me uh, introduce a couple of of end users. These are folks who are going to give you an idea of when you put these together and you start to use them, what does it mean to you? And so let me start off uh, with Barath from Meta. Uh, thank you, Curtis. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Bharat Mutaya. I am part of the infrastructure team at Meta. Uh, I lead the technical sourcing for various server and AI platform technologies. Uh, and from an end user perspective, uh, we really are very interested uh, from a meta perspective in terms of building out uh, a truly open and interoperable ecosystem. Uh, that is hugely important for us in terms of both uh, driving a rapid pace of innovation as well as best uh, performance for TCO as we look forward 
to our uh, evolving workloads. So in that capacity, um, we are really excited to be working with uh, open standards based organizations such as what was discussed earlier in this uh, presentation in terms of uh, jumpstarting the ecosystem. Uh, as an example, I will maybe take uh, CXO uh, to give you a sense of what are the types of end user pain points it helps solve. When we build out large infrastructures at scale, uh, over the past decade or so, it's pretty apparent that the code count growth has outpaced how much memory we are able to supply into the systems in terms of things like memory bank. As we look forward, things like chiplets are allowing us to scale code count much more cost effectively, and this is further exacerbating the strength. While there are native memory architectures that do come and support in terms of growing memory channels and uh, other types of memory integration, uh, they do have implications on power and cost, uh, which, which multiply quickly from an end user perspective. So there is a strong need for heterogeneity in terms of how we build platforms going forward. So we can mix and match at scale for the specific demands of the workloads. This is where we are excited, for instance, with CXL, where we are now able to drive a mixing and matching of different types of memory technologies on the same platform without necessarily growing the, the socket size too much, which adds to platform cost. And as well as uh, if we as a community come together and optimize around the software enabling and things like that needed for our workloads, we really see a promising path from these open standard based uh, architectures in terms of how we drive performance efficiency at scale going forward. We can chat a little bit more about these perspectives in subsequent sections, but now I'll maybe hand it off to, uh, to Glenn to talk about it from a Microsoft perspective. Yeah, so hi folks, my name is Glenn Ward. I'm a senior director of technology development at Microsoft. And I like a few of the things that Bharat said, it sort of resonates with what we see at Microsoft. I'd say a couple things. If I think about the trends that are taking hold in the industry, we do see core counts going up tremendously and the ability to attach memory to those core counts is increasingly challenging. That's really where CXL comes in for us. Um, we're super excited about CXL for disaggregated memory scenarios. One of the things too that we've learned as a hyperscaler is that the customer's king, right? So anything that we can do to make customers happy and particularly with um, uh, technology innovation that can give us a structural cost advantage. So having less expensive infrastructure is a big win for the customer because we can pass savings along to them. So things like being able to disaggregate memory for customers and attach you know, large banks of memory um, and not have to make the sort of uh, uh, runtime decisions or um, provisioning decisions that we may have to make today uh, that's just a big win. We can do a lot more things in real time or dynamically. It starts to get us to that kind of promised land of fungibility that we've talked about for a few years. So um, super excited about what's happening. You know, I think CXL for us has been at the forefront, but uh, certainly we're involved um, and heavily consuming what's happening in the others. Uh, really excited about the news that came out last week. Um, as my other position is uh, co-chair of one of the task forces for CXL Consortium. So we'll be talking about that more in the future, as Curtis said. Uh, but yeah, super, super excited. Thanks, everyone. All right, well, thank you. As you see, we have a very distinguished and experienced group of panelists here. So let's just jump right into the, uh, the round table. And again, remind people, if you're not talking, please stay muted. Uh, it'll help things go. Let me start asking the panel the first question, which is uh, kind of attachment, right? We've got these different ways to attach memory. We can attach them directly to the processor through DDR. We have CXL, we have Gen Z. What are the advantages and disadvantages maybe, or, or why would I attach to one and not the other as I go forward? You know, I'll, I'll start with Eric since he's looking at me. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So I think, um, as, as you mentioned, a, a local attach point uh, is sort of um, direct connected to the CPU, and the ability to share that resource if it's not being utilized 
uh, is, is limited or, or just not possible. Um, so some of these new interconnects that are being introduced in CXL and Gen Z allows to be able to more efficiently uh, share that resource, uh, reducing costs um, uh, between multiple nodes. There is going to be a, a little bit of a, a latency penalty um, as you sort of uh, move away from the CPU. Uh, we haven't yet figured out how to beat the, the speed of light, for example. Um, but the ability to utilize that memory in a heterogeneous way um, uh, is going to become very important from a, a cost savings perspective. And then you can start to think about different use cases where you can have multiple nodes uh, sharing that memory um, so there can be collaboration between multiple nodes um, so you can get some performance improvements that way as well. Okay. And Barath, uh, as, as you look at something like CXL and Gen Z, what, what do you see as memory you would have directly attached to a processor versus maybe something you'd put out on one of these inter interconnects? Um, sure, Curtis. I think I just want to kind of build on what Eric uh, just mentioned, right? So there is no uh, free lunch here. It's like when the flexibility you get from things like CXL do come with a latency penalty relative to native attached DDR memory, right? So the, the way we move this forward is like true hardware plus software co-design, right? In terms of making sure that the software layers are understanding of the platform topology and they try and make use of had intelligence in terms of how we do uh, near memory versus slightly farther memory, right? CXL, for instance, looks like a, uh, a second NUMA socket without the CPU. And how can you now drive more uh, intelligence, so the the maybe something which is a colder type of data uh, ends up moving into the CXL memory, and whereas the more hotter data stays on the DDR. And how do you build this intelligence through the infra software layers, be it the kernel and about functions, so that the applications uh, can drive uh, the benefits that we see. So it is going to be truly dependent on uh, hardware plus software co-design. Uh, that takes advantages of uh, these technologies going forward. Excellent, thank you. Um, Ahmad, let me ask you, one of the things that I've heard, right, is, is you get kind of media independence by putting a standard interface between the processor and different types of memory. Uh, you know, what's your point of view on the advantages or, or why customers might want that? Yeah, it's a really good point. You know, Eric, Eric touched on memory pooling and uh, Barat there on the actual hardware and software and how to enable it. Media independence is, is well, I feel, one of the exciting doors that CXL opens for us here, allowing processors to expand to different types of memory. So by allowing users to not necessarily be tied to that one memory technology that our processor supports, we can now start thinking about memory tiering in the similar way that storage tiering became a big thing. And so we can now optimize that system, you know, whether it's performance you're trying to optimize or capacity or cost. And so you can now have a choice of memory depending on what that application requires, right? So if that application requires a lot more bandwidth and or more capacity, you can now choose the lowest cost memory that fills that need. And so we'll see, you know, high performance applications still kind of predominantly being on uh, DDR4, DDR5, if you're just looking for a lot of capacity, then we start seeing persistent memory and, and storage class memory being used. And you can now kind of fine tune your system really depending on what that application needs. Excellent, any other panelists wanna chime in on this one or? I, I, I picked up on Ahmad, he was talking, talking about the persistent memory piece. So I would love to hear from Rochelle because she's been in the middle of that. Uh, you know, a lot of interest in persistent memory recently. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on the adoption rate, the benefits, overall uptake of why people are moving that direction? So what, if you kind of step back and look at, at the bigger picture, what all we're talking about here, what we're really talking about is allowing people to customize their configurations for the mix of applications they have in their environment, whether it's memory pooling uh, or, and, and you know, price performance, balance as well, whether it's, you know, memory pooling or aggregation or, you know, where is the bottleneck in your system and how do you optimize it as much as possible? And so that's honestly where a lot of the persistent memory comes in as well, is looking at those specific workloads where you see uh, 
you know, uh, I, I, I want a slightly different price performance ratio here. I can tolerate that, and I really need that, that level of acceleration uh, that you get from that, that hybrid technology in there. Um, so there's, we're, we're doing a bunch of things to help support that. We have about five hackathons a year, so anyone who wants to get in and start to play with the persistent memory environments, learn how it works. We also have a ton of educational materials coming out. Um, it's one of those technologies that has a really long lead time, so while we have had a couple of different vendors, um, we do expect to see a couple more showing up here. So um, there's, there should be, you know, a, you know in, in a few years you'll have multiple options out there in terms of, uh, you know, how you can put your configuration together, not just be, uh, you know, limited to a single vendor. So there's really, there's really a lot going on there. That's excellent. Yeah, it reminds me, you know, SNEA has been in storage for a long time. Storage started as a local yes. device and then moved out into a shareable commodity. I mean, do you see memory doing that same thing here in the next few years? Yes. Uh, you know, I think what we're seeing, and, you know, we kind of captured it a little bit in the title of this, talking about disaggregation. What we're really trying to do is allow people to have an easy and standardized way to you know, right size every component of the system. And that includes, you know, memory, memory pooling on top of, you know, uh, op aggregators for specific workloads. Um, one of the things that's working, we're working on is in the uh, SNEA side is computational storage. You can think of that as, you know, aggregators uh, capabilities and accelerators, sorry, I'm using the wrong word there, accelerators for um, specific workloads. Um, and, and, you know, how to optimize that whole environment, put it together. The key to all of that is actually, though, manageability. If you, you don't really want to end up with all of these different pieces and parts and not be able to manage them consistently, which is where Redfish and Swordfish can come in and why all the groups are working together on manageability. Makes a lot of sense. And Glenn, when, when you introduced yourself, you kind of talked about some of the advantage of being able to disaggregate the memory. Um, do you see persistent memory being part of that disaggregation, or are you thinking it's kind of standard memory? Uh, what, what use cases do you see as we look forward? Yeah, I do see persistent memory as part of what we disaggregate. I think it's, for us, the value prop is probably a bit less in the persistent quality and more that it's a, a pretty attractive tier of memory. It was something I was thinking about when uh, Baroth and Ahmad were talking is um, it's just kind of crazy when you think about uh, cloud computing is not shackled, but we're pretty hamstrung by legacy infrastructure, right? Where fast memory and slow disks have dictated so much of what we do. And when Microsoft began our journey into the cloud, we started realizing that, you know, cloud first applications were really born you know, with a certain use case in mind, like Twitter or Facebook, and you can actually see that materialize in the hardware design, right? Which is something like a lot of tweets. Well, that, you know, had a lot of, you know, uh, performance demands, and it's something very different than maybe hosting a generic VM where a hyperscaler may not know what the customer is doing in that VM, right? And that's part of why I talked about late binding at the beginning is that it, um, these technologies let us do a lot of customization at the very end of the, of the pipeline and that late binding quality is super attractive to us. Persistent memory per se is probably, hits a sweet spot for us because not every application needs crazy fast memory. A lot of applications are happy and would be extremely happy with uh, memory performance that's maybe a little bit uh, sub what they get with super fast memory, but then the costs can be passed along to them or there's more scalability or resiliency to their app as a result of implementing something like persistent memory. So. Yeah, it's kind of our, our take in a nutshell. Excellent. Baroth, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think in terms of uh, optimizing for, uh, like Glenn mentioned, right, in terms of optimizing for performance, um, it is definitely trending towards a not one size fits all kind of an infrastructure, right? Even within the cloud, we do need to tier it based on the specific use cases. And there is going to be specific optimizations we need to do at the kernel and other levels. And so while there is a lot of work happening within this consortium, maybe the additional point I do want to make is how do we kind of work together and jumpstart an ecosystem across the various technology providers, as well as 
the uh, uh, the system providers so that as these specifications from these consortiums evolve at a specific clip, uh, the technology providers and the system providers do match with that cadence so that like if you take an inclusive perspective, you don't want to have a solution, for instance, in the 2023 timeframe that implements uh, different points of CXL, like between 1.0 and 2.0 and different kinds of uh, uh, specifications, which kind of leads into a uh, difficulty from an end user perspective of scaling these into deployment. So we do really need to make sure that as the, uh, the specifications evolve, we drive for some level of consistency with how the, uh, the technology providers and system providers evolve. So it makes the process of qualifying and launching these new techs into mass production a little bit more seamless without a lot of overhead. Excellent. So I'd like to put Ahmad and in, in, uh, Eric in a little bit of a challenge here. Of, you know, as you think about this relative to your interconnects, the CXL, Gen Z stuff, how do you see them either helping to realize the visions or are there things that need to, to be added to, to make that uh, vision a reality? Well, I think whenever you start to add resources to an interconnect, um, uh, security and RAS features become incredibly important. So uh, particularly as your, your node count or comp uh, component count increases, the, the probability of fail failures increase and being able to um, you know, still get to the, the data uh, is very important. And um, so we, we think things like, like multipathing are, are very uh, important. Um, um, you know, being able to communicate um, events as they occur uh, is very important. And uh, we're, we're showcasing some of those uh, capabilities uh, in, our, in our demos downstairs. Um, I do agree that you know, there, there's, a, there's a great um, uh, capability of, of adding all of these resources, uh, but you still need to manage them and you still need to handle errors uh, as, as they come up. Okay. Ahmad, do you want to add to that for us? Yeah, I think Eric covered a, a lot of the key points there, uh, especially when you talk about RAS and kind of this term of blast radius, right? When we have a lot of memory that's sitting uh, either pooled, being used by a number of hosts in this disaggregation model, or even aggregating the performance of multiple persistent memory devices behind a CXL switch that then you can have a single connect to the, uh, to the CPU. You're talking about a lot of memory at this point and both having to make sure you have the right RAS features, but also the, um, the management of those devices, whether it's the device itself, the fabric uh, devices, such as the switches or the actual media and being able to actually communicate those errors correctly to the host, being able to have a fabric manager that can you know, correctly manage this entire device and understanding where the errors have occurred and being able to report that to the users, that's gonna be really important. And you know, we've done a lot of work within CXL, a lot of work with working with SNEA to really also reduce the investments and then also simplify the test infrastructure that needs to be placed in. So having these standard based both device and fabric managers will really help that adoption of persistent memory and other emerging technologies. Excellent, excellent, thanks. So you guys both kind of mentioned the management. So let me jump into that and, and pull Jim into this conversation as well. Um, you know, once we've got memory in multiple locations and we're starting to access it in different ways, the, the whole management of that starts to get a little more complicated than when it's directly attached to the processor. And Jim, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you see the complications are, what work's being done amongst the consortiums to help to over, uh, come to overcome that challenge, and then what we should expect to see? Um, well, you're right that fabric management becomes one of the key uh, features here. Um, we have on the Gen Z side started with a, a prototype um, that only has basic features and, and we really need input from the wider community as to what uh, new features to add to that. Um, you know, basic uh, crawl out of the fabric is, is obviously one thing. You have to identify what's there. You need standards to do that. Um, you need to uh, interact with the higher levels of the management stack with OFA and those things to, through, through Redfish and, and there are you know, proposals to have agents to do that. Um, there's all kinds of features that that these 
fabrics are probably going to have, like uh, both uh, uh, on the wire and uh, at rest encryption, and you need to manage that. You have key management, um, all kinds of challenges that uh, are, uh, are to be faced, and the fabric manager has to deal with all of that. Excellent. And Rochelle, you've seen industry bodies work together. Um, yeah, you know, it's part of OFA, part of SNEA. Tell us, what what are we going to see? How does this work? Does it take years, or can it be done in a short time? It can be. Well, that's a good question. Is how long is this stuff going to take? And one of the nice things that's been happening in the last few years is standards bodies are moving much more quickly. Uh, so Redfish and Swordfish, as an example, release two or three updates a year, sometimes four. Mm -hmm. it, it's incremental, uh, you know, incremental support, none of this waiting for a couple of years to even get the standard before you can actually then start working with it. Um, the other piece is, as, as Jim was just describing all of these different aspects, um, there's so much more co collaboration work happening now. I'll pick, you know, security, uh, key management pieces, We've, we know how to do that for other technologies. It's not a new problem. All you kind of have to do is say, hey, we need this, and you can leverage it from someplace else. You, there's no re wheel reinvention required. Uh, so, you know, the uh, uh, key management, uh, certificate management are all being built into Redfish and Swordfish because we're doing it uh, at a higher level in the system. So everything's there. That's also going to help us accelerate the work quite a bit because we don't need to uh, you know, come up with a Gen Z specific way or a CXL specific way. Was like, here's the standard way we present it to the users. This actually works across your entire environment. Here's the lo the you know, here's just the pieces you need to instrument. We're also doing that with security, uh, SPDM. I won't tell you what it stands for because it's dumb. But <laughs> this is standard a standardized model for attestation. Runs at a low level, but it's being leveraged everywhere, and that's something that we can bring in as well. So yes, security is very critical. Um, but let's leverage all the pieces that we're using for both manageability and data path that are already defined in existing standards. That's great. Um, I yep. have one more comment oh, too. Go ahead, so please. she was talking about acceleration of, of work, and I think another aspect of that is that a lot of this is happening in open source. You can go to GitHub, you can contribute, you can see the code. It's not you know some proprietary warehouse that you have to pay gazillions of dollars for, but yeah, um, it's all out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we're encouraging more of as well uh, is partnering between open organizations and standards organizations, uh, so that. The, the groups that are getting together to talk, up, like OC, you know, uh, the Open Compute uh, platform is a great example. They're getting together to talk about the configurations they need, uh, but they partner with the, the standards organizations to say, you know, so they're basically creating a recipe. And here's what we want, here's, you know, here's the specifics, what we need for this specific configuration, and you do it through these standards developed by other organizations. So it becomes just a you know, big collaboration and partnership. Uh, the, we've all kind of alluded to some work that we're doing between uh, uh, fabrics in general, uh, Gen Z is the first one engaging here, and the OFA, where we're just building an open source reference implementation for a management framework that should work across all types of fabrics. And we're feeding all of our learnings both up and down. So we're making sure that Redfish and Swordfish are fully popul populated with all the right properties and and working in a standardized way across different fabric types, and then we're feeding that information down to you know, Gen Z as it's coming up to speed to say these are the things you need to be able to do, um, and helping to also again to prioritize that you know that functionality that should be implemented that Jim was just talking about. Excellent, and Barath and, and Glenn, let me put you on the spot a little bit. You know, as industry bodies do this kind of work, how easy or how hard is it? to bring that into the work that you're doing to advance what you want to get done in your companies? Yeah, I can, I can start if you like. I think it's pretty easy. I think one of the big benefits to Microsoft, at least, of participating in the initiatives that are discussed here is that it just launches everyone's comfort factor, everyone's uh, contributions that we're making internally all of a sudden we have a forum to do that in and we you know by virtue of having to there's just an old old industry phrase like eat your own dog food but by virtue of having to consume the things that we're putting out there we're making 
um, you know, better internal product brand plans and uh, more consumable uh, kind of drops that we're putting into um, the standards bodies that we're working with. So I'd say the uptake is quite high. It's, uh, Curtis, you and I work together, but one of the things that I always track is when we have trainings at the different consortiums, you can see it's a really good health monitor to see sort of the blip of, uh, or the, you know, the, the stacked bar of attendees from my company and some of our peer companies. And when you see those things take off, you're like, yeah, we're cooking with gas. Um, and you can really see the momentum of a, of a standard and kind of the, the hot standard as it were um, take off because everyone you know in the industry is participating in it and it's just moving super quickly and that just makes for a lot of excitement. We, we absolutely have that with what we're talking about today. So yeah, I'd say the consumability, Curtis, is super high and uh, participation levels across Microsoft, like all the groups, you know, that it takes to deliver cloud services and build cloud hardware, you know, 100% high engagement level. Thanks. Uh, Bharat, how about yourself? Yeah, I think to add to what Lynn said, I think the two things that we look for is uh, uh, the broadness of support from ecosystem and the uh, pace of iteration of the spec that I think was talked about earlier. Uh, we really do see the, the pace of spec evolution picking up quite a bit and that we feel comfortable that this will meet our demands, the things improving perhaps on an annual-ish basis. So for instance, I think Amar talked about how the CXL spec has evolved between 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 a relatively uh, quick time and also uh, the senior uh, comments were also similarly in line. So the pace at which the spec is evolving and the openness of it really makes us feel comfortable about investing our software and porting efforts in terms of making these technologies successful. And uh, so far from that perspective, it's been good. And similarly, uh, it does require a lot of work with the ecosystem partners in terms of uh, ensuring interoperability. So for instance, if you take something like a CXL memory expander, it does require uh, various types of CPU architectures, different types of memory technologies, as well as the various uh, expansion or pooling solutions, and then finally motivating the system providers to kind of get on this journey and build platforms and solutions. Um, I think we have started this journey and it is starting to kick uh, into momentum, And but it is still the long road in front of us. We really do need the entire community to work together in order to drive this forward, but I think we are off to a good start. Excellent. All right. Uh, so one last question, and, and maybe I'll, I'll start it with Eric on this one, is down at the show floor, we've got a, a demo that spans across, I think, three booths. Tell us a little bit about that demo, what it's showing off, and, um, you know, have other people jump in and, and help out with, with what they're going to see when they get there. Sure. Yeah, so I, I think it's a pretty cool demo. Um, we're, we're stretching from the CXL consortium booth to the Gen Z consortium booth, to Intelprop booth. Uh, we do have some, some wireless uh, connection uh, to the Open Standards Pavilion, uh, which is pretty nice. So really four, three and a half, let's Okay, call. I'll take that, thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, in, in the CXL booth, we're showing a uh, CXL to Gen Z fabric adapter um, that has a uh, multi-path connection uh, optically 30 meters into the uh, Gen Z consortium booth. Uh, we have a few different layers of switches uh, in, in that booth, media boxes, uh, which we then can configure using uh, Fabric Manager software and present and allocate different resources to different nodes uh, in the fabric. Um, so it's a pretty exciting demonstration of both uh, proof of concept uh, FPGA-based implementations of multiple um, uh, protocols um, and also the fabric management software that's running um, that we have codenamed Zephyr and then also a connection to the, the OFA uh, Open Fabric Management Framework um, in the Open Standards Pavilion booth. Excellent. Uh, you know, Jim, if you wanted to add anything, I know I've talked to you a couple times about it down there. Well, yeah, well, Cur Curtis got pretty excited when we, when we had a little graph of the topology. We did a crawl out of the, the Zephyr, uh, discovering the Gen Z fabric, and then we, uh, uh, for the first time ever, uh, pulled a cable and uh, saw the line change to red, the line representing the link going down, and uh, plugged it back in, and it went green again, and we were all cheered, so. Excellent. So uh, anybody who hasn't seen it, you know, walk, you know, walking a network probably isn't anything new, but walking a memory semantic fabric 
is new. It hasn't been done. It's really cool to watch. Um, so I encourage you to go down there and see that. Uh, now we come to the, the Q&A session. I think uh, pop through here. And if you wish to ask questions, is there a mic in the room or do they just have them, have them stand up and ask a question? Uh, if you're... Oh, certainly will. And if you're online, please uh, send your question uh, online and we'll, we'll catch it in uh, the chat. Um, so we got one question from Steve. Uh, let's see. There's actually three different comments. Ah, okay. At various points through the conversation. The first one, um, the I wonder what latency is going to be, was actually when Ahmad was doing the presentation on CXL. Uh, so I don't know if there was a specific point um, in a or a specific uh, configuration you're asking about latency or if there was a question about latency in general, but maybe uh, one of the CXL guys can yeah. jump in on that one. Yeah. Ahmad, do you want to, to take that, you know, what kind of latencies do we expect? Yeah, I'll cover a few different uh, ones. So if we're talking about uh, CXL direct attached with a memory control used on CXL.mem, you know, the targeted latencies that we're looking there is in the range of a new model. Right, so kind of what, what the industry has been used to in a Yuma hop, those are the kind of the, the targeted latencies there. As we start going to CXL switches, that's where we're going to start seeing latencies increase. Uh, and that's where then we need to take a look at, well, what types of memory will sit behind a switch and where will that usage cases be? Uh, and can those applications tolerate that additional latency? Uh, we're certainly going to be above a NUMA hop when we get to CXL switching. Of course, we'll take a, we'll have to see what the uh, ASIC providers provide and how low they can get that latency. But once you get to the behind the switch, then you have to take into account well, what types of memory should sit behind there given the higher latency. Is uh, you know high bandwidth DDR5 still the the choice, or perhaps persistent memory that can is already higher latency, lower bandwidth? Perhaps that's the right decision that goes behind it and a combination of the two depending on that application. All right, thank you. Next question comes in from Scott. Uh, says, when considering a socket with different types of media attached, uh, and he gives HBM, DDR, persistent memory, or disaggregated memory with remote persistent memory, how will programmers reason about the different characteristics of the various options? Will they be exposed to a numer domains? Will they be transparent and treated as you know, fast memory is closer. Um, so how's that gonna, how, how are programmers gonna see this? Uh, maybe Jim, see if you wanna take I'm that Because I'm the software one. guy here? Yeah, no. because you're the software guy here, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna pick on you. So sure, <laughs> um, certainly we're just exploring that ourselves now. Um, but what we're doing in the, in the prototypes we have on the floor uh, is that we put the remote memory uh, across Gen Z in its own NUMA domain and using the same, um, kinds of slit tables and such that you would see in ACPI in a, in a host, you uh, can reason about the difference between the local latency and the, and the remote latency. Okay. And so you, you have this idea of you know, near memory and then medium memory and far memory, or what do you see happening there? I suspect that there will, yes, will be several tiers that okay. will have to be represented. And we need other other kinds of representation as well. So, you know, our ACPI has also got uh, this table called HMAT, the heterogeneous memory, something or other. And uh, and so it can represent some of those other properties about persistence and, and things that, that were in the question. Okay. Um, it, do we have latency? You know, there's some questions in here, just kind of looking for a rough latency. Um, so, you know, what, what do we have for latency numbers? So I, I can I can talk to that a little bit. So we have um, you know different latencies depending on different switch hops. Uh, what we're doing now is uh, in FPGA implementations, so it's not specifically latency optimized. Um, we think with uh, ASIC silicon it'll be substantially faster than what we have. Um, but we have you know in FPGA through multiple hops uh, on CXL hosts we have you know, sub you know 800 nanosecond type latency. Expectation is that will uh, improve significantly as some of these pieces start to get hardened. Okay. And then I, I understand from CXL, they're kind of looking at roughly, you know, if you have CXL attached memory, it'd be like talking to the other socket in a, a two socket memory. Yeah, so the, the, the NUMA hop uh, yeah. is sort of the target. So, you know, what we see in a multi socket server today, um, you know, 
think about it uh, as a new hop to get to a seed cell memory device. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. Um, that's kind of the questions that we have online. Um, I think there was it, one more in oh, here that we can target to Glenn. It was, uh, is there any significant new software targeting persistent memory from Microsoft? So I think, I, yeah, Glenn, that's really just, you know, what are we looking at from an application layer up on adopting these technologies? Yeah, unfortunately, there is nothing I can comment on at this time. All right. Um, so maybe not the most satisfactory answer, but you, you know, usually when somebody says that, that means they're thinking about it, if nothing else. <laughs> um, so let me, uh, let me just get maybe from the end user side of uh, point of view, uh, Glenn and Barath, what do you have advice for other end users as they look into Gen Z, CXL, and the fabric manager that's being developed there? You know, do you see this as something that you'd be interested in and able to implement in the near term, or is this something that you think is, is many years out? Uh, you know, I can start. I think it probably depends on what you consider to be near term. Um, I, I'd say it does meet my definition of near term that probably, well, not probably, but within the next generation two at most, uh, you will see offerings that are lighting up the technologies that we're talking about today, no question. Um, and it, you know, as evidence of that, just walk the booths, right? CXL booth, Gen Z booth, you know, lots of products and lots of announcements, you know, last week at OCP, this week at Supercompute. So the wave is definitely there. Uh, you know, we're, we're here, uh, our companies, as a testament to our belief in the technology, and that really means uptake, like I spoke to, you know, earlier. Um, uh, maybe a little bit of teething pains, but I'd say probably a year, a year-ish is the sweet spot. But for how fast these things are moving, um, I would caution people about, you know, a wait and see approach could translate to being left behind. Um, so I would strongly recommend uh, playing with the technologies, downloading, ensuring that, you know, your products are compliant if you're in the product business and or you're using uh, some of the latest sandboxes that we have uh, among the hyperscalers so that you get a chance to kick the tires. And the only thing I would add is this is definitely a, a mindset change, right? I think if, you have, uh, if you're a software developer, one of the most important things that you love is local attached memory, right? That's kind of something that you are pretty passionate about. So I think changing from that into this paradigm requires a mindset change and that requires to discuss the broader challenges of deploying, think what we have done in the past at scale for the next 10 years and why that just doesn't scale. And as long as uh, our software developers start to see that, uh, then they embrace the challenge of doing different types of partitioning and driving intelligence into the infrastructure software layers in order to make use of these technologies. Uh, definitely, I think uh, this is going to be a pretty exciting ride for the next 10 years. And uh, uh, I think like Glenn said, People do need to get started on it now, otherwise they'll significantly fall behind. So I think we do need to start moving now. Okay, and we got one last question in uh, for Microsoft and Meta. How pervasive will disaggregated memory be? Will all the servers have this eventually? And how keen are you on needing this? I think the scale of uh, deployment is maybe a question that we cannot answer. Uh, but in terms of the, the need for it, we definitely see the need for it, which is why we are investing in this technology and the standards bodies and working with the ecosystem partners. Okay. And I know we're getting close to the end here. Um, we did have one other question. Is there a place to go play with this stuff? The answer is right now, no. Um, some of the first demos of uh, CXL are on the show floor here. Um, and so I encourage you to visit our booths at uh, 1607, 1707, 1507, I think are, they're just all in a row as we talked about. So really want you to get down there, take a look at what the industry standard bodies are doing and particularly CXL and Gen Z and their booths are doing. And then finally, I'd, I'd like to thank all of our, our uh, panelists uh, locally, uh, Jim and Eric from Intelloprop, Rochelle from in Intel, and then uh, on the phone, we have Ahmad uh, talking about CXL from Microchip, and then Barath from Meta and Glenn from Microsoft. So a round of applause for them, please. 
Thank you very much. I hope to see you locally down on the show floor looking at uh, all the cool demonstrations that are going on. And just one note, there's a, also in the, for any of the virtual participants, there is a, a whole set of online virtual uh, video demos as well in the CXL Consortium uh, online booth. Excellent. Thank you again. Everyone enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.